Welcome to Get After It with Nashi, brought to you by Ace Property Management and Sales. Good on you, good on you. But Andrew, I really appreciate you joining me. I know this, I don't know, I've followed you for a while since um, since I had Andrew Cotton on the show. Um, yeah. And we did, a, we did an Instagram Live, I think, through lockdown and bits and pieces, but really enjoy your fitness. And I can't profess to be a very good surfer, but your surf fitness and your mindfulness, wellness, yoga, everything that you do and the content you put out is of great interest to me. And I get quite a lot from it. So I just thought I'll reach out, see if we can make this happen. And here we yeah, are. Thank you. I appreciate it. And um, the best surf is the one with the biggest smile, of course, remember? So. Okay, right. That's that's good. Well, we don't we don't get the the Nazare waves up here um, on the east coast of Scotland. We don't get the big waves of Devon and things like that. But I think there's enough. Yeah. There's a pretty good surf surf culture up here. We've got some surf schools. My wife's part of our groundswell community that we've got up here, and there, there's quite. I love it. Yeah, I've never actually. I'd I'd love to go. I've never. I've, I played football at university in Edinburgh, but that's the only time, sadly, that I've been to Scotland. But been all around the world but haven't been to the I'd love to go to the Hebrides and where are you are you near Thurso then we, no we're, we're we, um, east coast just outside Edinburgh so, oh sorry yeah have you heard of North Berwick you heard of North mm. Berwick no I mean a little yeah. village called Long Nidri on the east coast so the, most of the surfing we do is on beaches like Pease Bay Thornton Lock um we'll go along to Dunbar um, and there yeah there's surf schools there's lots going on it's a great community but I, I hope that we'll you and I talking here can really introduce you to the, the community in Edinburgh, the community in Scotland, um, mm. and just get some hints, tips, and, and obviously talk about your your um, excursions that you do and the, the getaways that you take on. But I'm keen to know just about the, the breath work, the how, how to improve life as sort of general mums and dads, people of society, the little things yeah. that you do, and that's kind of a lot of the content and the, the information I, I I like to find out myself, but let alone following you for so long, I'm interested in the way you do things. So what's your background? Where did you start? How did you get into fitness in the sort of world you're in just now? Yeah, well, I started, um, I was lecturing sports science at the North Devon College for sort of 10 years. So I was doing A-levels, B-techs, foundation degrees. And um, I did that for about 10 years. And then I... um, I had a sabbatical. So I had a year off where I traveled to New Zealand and taught as an English and PE teacher. And um, then when I got back from there, I sort of thought, I didn't want to be one of those teachers who was just still teaching when they were sort of 60. So I thought, try something different. And actually when I, so I started, the, first of all, I started doing, um, cause I used to teach sports science. So I had a sort of background anyway, but then I did some other courses like in personal training and. And then I started, um, yeah, and then I started doing, first of all, I started started doing boot camps and then a bit of personal training whilst I was part-time doing the foundation degree. And then, um, then we started doing these retreats, these camps. So then I stopped teaching part-time and we would do France every, um, French, French retreats every um May and September and then me and Cotty started doing who you've had on haven't you we started doing the Nazare surf fitness retreats um twice a year as well so and then from that I sort of m- not just by accident really I mean I got into the the mind I mean I did I did my yoga teacher qualification and and I was always quite scientific and I was really into the sport and the science but I surprisingly the bit I enjoyed most was the mind and the chant and weirdly I wasn't expecting that because I wasn't really a very spiritual person but I just realized and then working with Cotty and the other big wave surfers I soon realized that actually the mind was the most important thing and really uniquely those guys were able to use fear and uh, um and stress and be inspired by it. Not only were they extremely calm under stress, they were inspired by it. So I thought that could be really useful for other people. So that's when we've started to get into the mindfulness and the talks and the breathing. And we've done it with other athletes and things now. And um, I mean, it's really gone, it's gone crazy, hasn't it? The last <laughs> the last year or so, the, the breath work and stuff. And just because it's so simple, but so, so powerful. Well, I'm interested, obviously, a career path in teaching and then moving away from that 
mean, was mm. that quite a tough thing to do or did you just take to it quite naturally or was there a worry about income and lifestyle and what's going to happen here? Am I going to have a career in this other direction? Yeah, I've always been, I've always been one of those people that doesn't like to do one thing for too long. Like even, <laughs> I seem, I like new challenges, even in my teaching, like if I'm teaching yoga or fitness, I don't like to repeat too often. So I like new challenges and I like learning new things. So I've, you know, probably often I probably do too, too, too many different things rather than becoming, but I, 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 I my mind likes the challenge of new, new, new opportunities and new things. So, so yeah, it was a big, it was a big risk at first because obviously a te- an annual teaching salary and a mortgage and stuff. And it's a little, always a little bit of a gamble, but, um, I did it anyway. And, uh, yeah, you haven't looked back. And, and, and look back, still got a roof over my head and still can. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah just got lucky. It's, it's a brave decision, but you've got, you went all in clearly mm. and, and you've, you've reaped the benefits and meeting someone like Cotty and a big wave surfer and, and bringing mm. your, how, how far into his career was he when you met him and did he start using your techniques? Well, we, um, we were friends actually when we, well, he was in a different school than me. So I met him when we were about 16 Okay. And so he was, and when he started to get successful at surfing, he was like, because mm. he was, we would train together a little bit, but he would always do the same sort of training. He would just cycle, surf, and all sort of steady state stuff. And, and, um, and then, so we started training together probably at the, right at the start of his big wave career, actually. You know, we started training professionally together. I mean, as far as, um, and he 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 takes it on really well. He's got a good knowledge now of. Um, he's had to actually because he's had so many injuries. He's had to get be really good at making the body resilient to injury. And uh, and um, like many surfers or athletes, or especially surfers, they um, nowadays training's got quite popular and I thought I have actually done some sessions with the other professional surfers before and they're almost like gymnasts now aren't they at the top but it's very different for the big wave guys they need to be strong and stable and resilient and um and psychologically they need to be obviously very and they need to be lunatics basically controlled lunatics controlled <laughs> lunatics that, that take on these waves but at what point did I mean, yeah, being a lunatic will help someone like Cotty that, that is going to take on those 100-foot waves and, and go to mm. Nazare and dominate. But the mental toughness side to actually get on the water and paddle mm. out or, or go out with a jet ski to, to put himself in the position to take the wave on, what do you guys work on to, to overcome that fear on the day of what he's about to encounter? It's, it's so strange, and it sounds ridiculous to, to say it, but because I've spent a few... I've spent um a few years ago i spent six weeks there with garrett and he and uh, he's got his toe partner and he um they're very it, it's almost like they've done it so often they're almost comfortable in an well for, for most of us we would be absolutely petrified and panic but they've progressively done it over the years so often that they're strangely calm in that situation obviously there's nerves but it's the same with other athletes you know same with uh, rugby players or anyone if you can um have a positive relationship with those nerves and those guys like i said at the start have got a, a, an interesting ability to stay calm under stress even enjoy stress and i think that's what we've tried to use when we have um, doing it with other athletes or other talks that that other people can actually even though you know they're not going to surf an 80 foot wave but they can use it for other challenges, you know, cultivate a real challenge response in other areas of stress and another, and, um, and with the breath and the mind, harness a capacity to, to stay calm under that stress, to, to change your physiology and change your neurochemistry. And, and um, yeah, and I mean, Garrett, I've seen him smile as a 50 foot wave lands in his head. He almost enjoys, enjoys that. And um and it's, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous to say, but they're, they're conditioned into enjoying fear, which is yeah, amazing. What about their, have you, do, you, do you talk about their relationship with death with them? 
in that I mean the extreme level of sport that they take on that death mm-hmm. is a real consideration when they go under those waves and if they mm-hmm. don't get their breathing right if they don't get that last breath right they are dicing with death at some point does that ever come up or, or ever it does it does and the interesting thing is i think that's the difference between them and people that don't do it they don't really fear it and um, there's a there's a really interesting uh, this is going off on a bit of a tangent but there's a really interesting type uh, meditation which is sounds pretty dark it's called death meditation and when you um, accept it, basically the, the concept is when, when you accept um, death, you no longer fear it sort of thing. But, but those, and there is a type of meditation where you learn to accept death as part of life and then you, and then you're, then you live the rest of your life in a different way. But that's not really answering the question, but the question for those guys was they don't really fear like with Cotty when he broke his back weirdly he was more scared of not being able to surf that day than not being able to walk again it was like <laughs> bizarre it was like yeah so I think they've got a different relationship with than the most of us so I wouldn't like myself I've done it um with Garrett and Cotty a little bit but nothing it's not for me you know I wouldn't want to do it to that 80 foot no, but can, crazy. You, can you go a bit deeper into the death meditation? Because I've never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably it. I don't know. I'm no good. I don't practice death meditation regularly. <laughs> I'm not a dark lord or anything. But I think that, and I don't know that much about it. I think that's probably all I know about it. Um, but maybe we should uh, we should practice one together. <laughs> well, 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 I'm just... But basically, it's it's the same with any negative energy, like. Um, like you can, like fear, for example, mm-hmm. it requires our resistance to grow, so does stress. So if you accept it, lean into it, it loses its power. And it's the same with death. Like if, if you, it, that's just the end range of stress and fear, obviously. But if you fear and stress and all of these things, um, you can learn if you accept them, um, embrace them, and the top athletes in the world, it's interesting, they can, they can be in, um, actually not only calm under stress, but you see them, don't you, thrive under stress. And that's, that's because they've accepted and leaned into that stress. And um, yeah, over the lockdown, I was doing a few sessions with rugby players and, and things with, and converting, you know, anxiety into, into, well, instead of it being a downward spiral to anxiety, you can access that space between the stress and your response to that stress. And in that space, in that space, you have power to change your body's response to stress and fear. So that's the, I mean, it sounds easy, but obviously it's like anything. You have to train it. You have to gradually train whatever your specific stress is until you get that, it's called a hormetic response where I think you adapt and grow. Yeah. In, and that's the same in the mind. Something that's such, it's much more accepted now is the psychological side of things and the training mm. your brain, training your mind, not just your muscles and your reflexes and your abs and your balance and all that sort of stuff. Spending time and connecting with guys like yourself that can mm. train different parts of the body that are so crucial because, say, cotty or rugby players are conditioned, their body's ready, but it can mm. be that sort of last little bit of percent that their, their mind gives up. Mm. And do you find that across most sports that there's similarities from a rugby player to a surfer or are they kind yeah. of all worried about different things? No, definitely. So it's, it's all, it's all related, isn't it? Like we said, whatever you're like for Cotty, it's an 80 foot wave. He's learned to enjoy it. But for the rugby players, it's a six nations game or, or, or you know, a world cup final. It's the, it's the same philosophy. Your body has the same physiological response. Your body and everyone starts. It doesn't. You don't have to be a professional athlete. It's anyone who's doing their sport or in their job. You know, you have your your physiology doesn't know what stress is coming. It, you, your body gets the same neurological response. So it's it's there that you have the power in life to embody these principles and practice them, and then you can learn to see life as a training ground for for that. And that's um, it's a good opportunity for lots of different people. I think. Yeah, as you mentioned, breath work is, it's not just professional sports, it's all walks of life that do it. 
now mm. and it can be better. But what? How, how do you train? Apart from telling Cotty to go in the swimming pool or the sea and just stay underwater for as long as you can, what, what mm. sort of techniques are you using? Because it's it's not just like if I was doing breath work, it's to help with mindfulness or reset myself mm. or something. For him, it's life or death. Hold yeah. your breath, control your breath, know when to take the breath. What sort of techniques do you differ from a life or death situation to mindfulness and, and relaxing at home and you know yeah well with Cotty and anyone who's in that extreme situation it's the ability to avoid panic so I've, I've seen you your Instagram you do some cold water swimming don't you yeah yeah and, and I bet it's particularly colder in Scotland than it is Devon but if you walk into I did a talk for some swimmers the other week um cold water swimmers which is Kerry Ann like um she was an Olympic swimmer, but she runs like she teaches people to teach cold water swimming. And I did a breath work session with them. And if you walk into ice cold water, you breathe, <gasps> you know, really fast, really short, really from the chest. So your body goes into stress response. So quite simply by breathe, slowing down the breath, less volume, longer exhalation, you change your physiology into until you and it's the vagus nerve, which is the 10th cranial nerve. You you breathe deeper simply by breathing deeper you tell your body you're calm so and then breathing lighter breathing with less, less volume breathing with a longer exhalation so if i go into ice cold water and i breathe don't think about breathing and i breathe 50 times a minute <laughs> my physiology listens to that breath as part of the brain it actually spies on that breathing and takes you into sympathetic response whereas if i go into the water and i breathe six times a minute instead of 50 simple but a really easy way of changing your body's response to that stress and that stress is the cold um but with with cotty and, and with the big wave surfers and actually now i've done the same with some of the rugby players it's it's training um the ability to manage stress it's also training um it's some priming the state so optimizing your state performance and not getting in that in sports psychology, it's called a downward spiral, being able to let that go and stay present and, you know, not be controlled by your thoughts, not identify with your thoughts, but be. Um, so it's performance, it's managing stress, and obviously another massive element is recovery. The ability to recover neurologically, psychologically, change your brain waves, change your physiology, reduce inflammation in your body, um, switch off that part of the brain which is constantly analyzing and thinking that that recovery after the game obviously but also within the game within points within where you can reset your body and mind so that's um so it's performance recovery and stress they're the main areas that we we've been looking at you see that a lot with goal kickers in rugby you, you mm. see them obviously they've, they've been running they've been busy they've been very active during the game but then they've got to slow themselves down and you see the deep breaths coming in yeah over the ball but the crucial moments are any kind of conversion or or kick that they've got to take what, what do you do with with normal clients that aren't every day in a high high performance environment or they're just wanting to improve their wellness. Is breathing, is breath work something that you try to... Sometimes, yeah. Like I had a client, sometimes I have clients come in to do training, but I can see something's not quite right. So I just make them lay down and do a restorative session instead. So, because, you you know, sometimes it's not all about pushing the body. It's listening to the body and psychologically, stress, trauma, all of that um, is physiological. Stress is a physiological response to your, in your body. Trauma, inflammation is inflammation. Inflammation causes disease. So if you can help somebody um, step back and have that simple awareness and turn the body in a way out of a... Because the, the mind, if you've got some stress in your life, whatever that is, it doesn't have... Not obviously not athletic performance. Your body is, is in an inflammatory state quite often. You're often in sympathetic state, which is... There's, there's two two parts of the nervous system the sympathetic and the parasympathetic two parts of the autonomic nervous system and most people are in the sympathetic and that's um action obviously we need that and it's the same with the brain waves as well the actual frequency of the brain most people all day are in a beta brain wave state which means they're constantly creating thinking analyzing 
and you get home, you switch on the TV, it's, still, it's not actually switching the, the brainwave state. So yeah, it's not just athletes, it's anybody can benefit from the ability to switch off. In fact, the better you become at switching off, the better you can be at enduring stress when it does come. And lots of people in business, myself, you know, even all day, you're, it's not easy to suddenly switch off and you get trapped in the in these habits of screens and phones and TVs. And, and it's hard to just realise that sometimes and step back and properly recover. I've spoken about that a lot and you can have a, a three-day holiday booked or a nice long weekend, but you go away and you never switch off. Mm. Not a long enough break that you're away from the office or off the sports pitch or away from your coach. Mm. You come back even more stressed because you think I need another holiday. God, I'm back into it. Did yeah. I really enjoy that? Was I present? Was I there? You yeah, know? and you need to... Aeroplane mode on the phone is key. That's what I try and do now. I realise I'm getting trapped in that. And I put it on aeroplane mode. And then because people can get you in too many different ways now, can't they? On the phone, so you need to just switch it off. And... I've, I've turned off. I don't have any notifications on my phone. So I've got yeah, no, I do that too, yeah. I've got to physically go into it. But then I'll still get lost and I'll go in to check a message and then I'll get lost in the phone. Mm. And it's incredible that, that it is the way. It's not uncommon. That is not a, I'm not embarrassed to say that because just about everyone does it. Everyone does it. And some people, a lot of the, a lot of the surfers are always sort of constantly. And if you go from that high intensity state straight into people analysing it and thinking, it's actually, um, it is quite addictive. So it's... Um, it's uh, it's it is hard to 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 snap out of it, but it's yeah. Uh, are you yeah, are you a routine guy? Are you a breath work in the morning, yoga in the morning, cold water dip? What kind of what kind of day do you sort of encounter? Yeah, I like to I like to think so. I'm one of those people who you know go through stages of doing having a great routine. Like uh, before the lockdown, I was no phones for two hours in the morning. Um, no phone for two hours in the morning, do my morning meditation, breath, session, and then I'd start start work. But then, then I started during lockdown doing these live classes and, and then people um, started to sort of enjoy them and then kind of rely on them. And then I got out of the habit. So I go through stages of, you know, giving that model answer of your early morning routine <laughs> and then go through stages of just drinking a cup of tea in bed and watching bad TV. You you <laughs> are human. you are human. That, that's, yeah, that, yeah. that's what you are. There's so much stuff out there. And, I, and I'm a cold water guy. I like to go in the morning, but my whole world's upside down now that business is back open. The world yeah. Started, kids are back at school. The grind is here again. It's not homeschool and time. Mm. Everything is busy again. Yeah. So that, it is it is great when you can. Like I did it this morning actually, went for in the sea. Um it's a great start to the day, isn't it? But um, my dad loves doing it. So he, I often drag him down there and he loves it because he's better at it than I am. Better in that I get colder than he does. <laughs> and he enjoys that, the fact that. <laughs> what about just when you do, you, you, you go into that little routine of the cups of tea in bed or you, you, you don't do the, your, your phones on immediately. Are you good at snapping back in or do you usually wait for something to ignite you or do you wait until it gets so bad that you think right shit i've got to draw a line in the sand here and i've got to just do <laughs> half an hour tomorrow then an hour the next day yeah i think the key is it? i think that's the key with a lot of people and when i you know doing personal training with clients if you have one bad day or one have one bad moment and it's the same going back to sport if you have one bad pass or one bad way it's learning to get out of the downward spiral because and um, once one thing happens in sport or in life, if you do one bad thing, if so, you go, oh, I've eaten a, um, oh, well, I've eaten a chocolate cake for breakfast and a pint of Stella again. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you can stop. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean you have to. It's the guilt, isn't it? It's real. It, it comes back to awareness. Simple. Rather than being identified and being swept away by your thoughts, you can observe them just for a moment. And then you can go, oh, right, I can be more present. I can be. So it's, that's, tra that's training. It's training the capacity not to get in the downward spiral, isn't it, of life or, or whatever it is. And what so I'm usually quite good at realising that. Um, yeah. But 
Do you look to yeah, bring people on. in? Do you look to bring people in? Is there people in your circle that you rely on to re-inspire you, or are you you quite independent in that regard? Yeah, there's a lot of um, yeah, I am quite independent. I was going to say there's a lot of good people who I do a lot of different things with, but I suppose a lot of the time I am quite independent in in that regard. Like I managed to, I'm quite self, quite good at being self motivated. And, and um, what what did COVID do to your business? You've taken things online and things. Is it adapted anything that you had never thought of? Is it brought in techniques and and mm. online content and, and business opportunities that you now look at thinking, God, I wish I'd done this. Yeah. A ago? Yeah, I was really in, in that in the business respect. I was quite lucky because I I couldn't do classes anymore and I couldn't do one on ones anymore. But I started to do online stuff and I did I actually did things I wouldn't ever have done before like I did some uh I did a talk with online um with Microsoft and I did a talk like just a breathing session and I started doing stuff with um I did some set one of the rugby players I was working with um was playing for England so he got me some so I did some sessions with them and and all on zoom yeah. So I did like four or five sessions with them, and then they had the worst Six Nations they'd had in seventy years. So that wasn't very good for my CV. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then um, I did the Team GB, the Team GB Seven. So I did some stuff. All of that stuff I probably wouldn't have done in person. So yeah, I did sometimes. Sometimes there is opportunities for new. You know, in difficult times generally, there's op- sometimes opportunities to do new things, isn't there? And I was very fortunate to do things like that. From yeah, and obviously with your business Surfbit, but is rugby yeah. and, and you, you, what you do obviously can blend into other sports. Is there any sports you haven't worked with yet? Is there anything that you think I'd love to get into that environment or? Yeah, because it's relevant to anyone, isn't it? Like really like um anyone can optimize the potential of the mind and, and recovery and learn to like um a couple of the things we've done me and Cotty together um we we that's what we do we relate it to so we did a thing at uh, a talk the other day at bear grills festival in south devon and he I basically that. that looked good that looks really oh, yeah good. it's good yeah. so he basically talks for about 20 20 minutes about his career and his big wave surfing and then I say how he prepares for it and how it could how some of the tools can be relevant to you and your thing and, and because he's actually done it I think it gives it a little bit more um people can relate to it and buy into it a little bit more yeah. because of the, the, the what he's done so that um yeah so that's quite good is that something you guys are going to take on tour? Are you going to go a bit further? Yeah, well tour, well tour. <laughs> but is it? You no, we could. We've done it. We did a list. We did one in um, Lisbon because we're often in Portugal that time of year. We did a web summit, similar thing. And yeah, it's something that we we could do more of. But um, we're both quite good at doing things, but we're both not very good at organising or marketing them <laughs> so you, you can you, if you're told where to be and, and what the schedule is you can need get a manager it. yeah you need a manager well, no i think there's a I mean, which got he has but yeah we have like someone who helps but. yeah but i think there's something in that just with even mm. up here when i think about the amount of people that go surfing on my the coast that i'm on mm. something that you, you you see a couple of guys on tour from devon that big way surfer professional mindf- mindfulness coach mm-hmm. and all that sort of thing i think there's a real market in that and there's, there will be mm. people out there doing it but the experience and this, what you guys can bring to yeah. an event is quite exciting. And how did you get involved with the, the Bear Grylls event? Because uh, there's a there's a um, Everest summiteer called Molly Hughes. You mm. met Molly or heard that she was down there. Yeah, uh, and I heard her. I didn't, we got there afterwards, I think. Yeah, but she was there. So I, I watched it quite closely and thought it was brilliant what was going on. How did you get involved in that? And you- well, again, I think I think they just asked Cotty, and he um, he didn't want to do it on his own. So yeah, How simple as that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I don't think I was the inspiring person. I think they just asked him, and he um, he was too shy. No, he it's quite funny because, and I, this was my opening line in the talk. He, he is more. He has more fear going and talking to a, a tent full of a hundred people than he does 
uh, if an 80 foot wave's coming or he's just about to surf. And that's a really interesting psychological uh, is thing, it? isn't it? Why is that? Well, some people, he, 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 to, he's done really well because originally he was terrible at public speaking and he hated it. But he's actually does it quite, he does it as a job now. He, he travels around the world telling, you know, doing good talks on dreaming big. And he's actually he did a TED talk and he's actually learned um, to be good at it. And my, I did a talk about three years ago in London. It was a big company and I was, and I remember there was like quite a lot of people there for me. Like I'd been used to teaching. So it wasn't like I wasn't used to talking in front of people, but it was a big, it was different. There was a massive theater of, 300 people or so and I was like really nervous and I think I'd drunk too much coffee before going on and one of the guys said to me you know nerves and excitement are the same physiological process in your body and you can choose the pathway you you can you go down and, I, and that was really interesting and since I've been looking into that quite a lot and it's true you know you can go cortisol adrenaline or you can choose excitement dopamine oxytocin all these positive hormones and and that simply starts with awareness, you know, that awareness of that moment. Um, so I, in that respect, I've learned to enjoy that. Like Cotty's learned to enjoy the big waves. I've learned to enjoy it. And I was always, I was always, because of my teaching and things, I was always comfortable talking. But it's different, isn't it, with different people and different audiences. Yeah. So are you saying there that you can sort of, like a switch inside your mind that will get you ramped up for the thing that you're not comfortable in yeah you can train yourself to have a different relationship with nerves but by sim simply by uh, simply starts with affirmation so do, doing this with my nieces the other day i was saying let just say to yourself i am excited three times and they were doing some sort of surf lifesaving event and and it yeah, it can, it's, I mean, the mind is powerful, but it's also very simple. You can, you can learn to, um, you can, it's called, uh, I think it's called plasticity, where you can train the mind to rewire the mind to take different pathways. So it's, um, and that's, it's, it, you have to train that, like you have to train other, like you have to train your body. Yeah. But it's, but it's also the mind, you can, you can freak yourself out about things that will never happen. And that daunting thing that, uh, I, I've done a lot of public speaking, hosting events and things like that. And it's a lot of people that are in the room want you to do really well. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And a lot of people, and there's no one that wants Cotty to fall and hurt himself in a big wave. So it's no. getting yourself before you step on stage or onto your board, mentally prepared that I'm here to do a job. People have mm. come here paid to be here. They want me to do well. They don't want a shambles. They don't want something to go wrong. Yeah. It's, it's flipping the mindset to... You'll, you'll yeah know. your mind creates a movie doesn't it it creates a false reality and that's what a lot of a lot of um, fear and stress is actually your mind having a subconscious uh, subconscious spiral based on both past experiences or things that are because unfortunately the brain we have a negative cognitive disposition we're predisposed to look for the negative that's the way the brain set up, which is why like newspapers and that's so successful in this country because people thrive on. Uh, that's the way we're predisposed. So it's, it's um, it takes training to step out of that negative negative thought pattern mm -hmm. and know that you don't have to attach yourself to those thoughts. They are just messages. They are just information, and then you you can train your mind to to be, to, to be aware of that. And where do you start with your clients or athletes when something does go wrong? when actually they have been prepared, they've stepped into the arena, they've performed, and it's all gone wrong. It's the, the caught, he's gone under, he's not caught a wave, or the athlete hasn't performed on the day. And yeah. They're on a downward spiral. How, how do you, what's your first sort of method to attack that to get them back on track? Well, the, the, you, ha you can change your... Um, the first thing is to, let, to learn to, again, to learn to surrender to what you can't control. So you don't get in that downward spiral mentally. And then physiologically, you can rewire your state by, um, again, just connecting to the present moment using your breath. So again, you could, you, you could do a simple, um, if you're in a panic, panic is a dysfunctional response to stress. So you've already 
um, you've already stress has come up and if, you, if it turns to panic like for a surfer a big wave surf that's the worst thing you can do because as soon as you panic or you use all your oxygen use all your adrenaline and, and all your physiology changes but to come out of that panic whether it's for a surfer or anyone you you would simply come to a parasympathetic breathing pattern so if you do a simple four seconds in through the nose low slow and deep and eight seconds out through the nose you would take your body physiologically out of stress because stress is high heart rate high cortisol levels um, inflammation and if you do that breathing pattern actually physiologically it's impossible to stay stressed so that would be uh, a simple way of coming out of panic and have you been have you been there with Koti or anyone that has come out in that panic stage and you've actually had to step in start the breath work with them and have you been that close to to the failure of somebody that you've just had to react there and then um i've been not in the in the sea when they went actually because well, those guys are actually um not the best example but on our retreats you know and and generally because nazare is one of those places yeah where people you know it, it's not it is that it's crazy it is a crate so much water moving and so not actually those guys because they they um, they they're quite good at managing panic and not not panicking. But I've I've been on the beach before when people have yeah been panicking and you can you can try and help you know the breath with the breath work with slowing things down with um, and with yeah and with trying to get them out of that panic state. Yeah. What was with Nazare, as we, we've touched on, I mean, I've watched it on YouTube, I've seen it on the TV and things mm. like that. What's it like when you first experience it, when you first look at these 80-foot waves? What was it like? Did it take your breath away or was it? Yeah, and, and it's quite unique, Nazare, because you're right, you're so close to it. You can be right up on that lighthouse and it's breaking like right in front of you. It kind of, it's like, it doesn't seem real. And we, and um, when I was first there, I used to, I remember Garrett had me running up and down the beach getting the boards when they lost the boards. And they, even that was quite scary. You don't have to be, I was <laughs> ankle deep in water, but there's so much water. And you'd have to, and yeah, it's quite, um, it's a really unique place. And it's, um, it's quite, um, yeah, it's quite daunting. And what actually happens on your retreats when you go to Nazare? What's, what's involved in one of your retreats and what's the process? We just throw people off the lighthouse into an 80 foot <laughs> wave and then teach them that it wasn't that bad. No, no, we just um, recover we and just, breathe, recover and breathe. Yeah, no, it's a real mix of people we've had on those surf fit ones, and, and it's it's not about training to surf a, a um, giant wave, it's just let giving them some tools to apply in their lives, which which can help them, and that's phys phys physically. So, things you know to help them more resilient to in injury knees ankles back to help them move better efficiency of movement um help manage things like fear and stress in the mind and all these tools that the big wave guys have learned um they're quite applicable in other areas of people's people's life so it's um yeah it's, it's that sort of thing that we do do that there's a lot that you can take from what they're doing and put it into everyday life yeah yeah, there's so much of that. And what about the food? I'll read on the website and all the bits and pieces. The food's quite important on these retreats. It's quite um, quite a good standard, is it? Yeah, it's quite a good standard. Although he has got some like Sharps Brewery and Red Bull sponsors, the fridge are always full of, and there's a few. <laughs> it's good. But um, yeah, no, the food is really good. We have um, Casasana, a local food place um, that provides really nutrient dense breakfast, lunch, and dinners. And then, cause you know, it's fuel, isn't it? It's fuel and recovery and repair cause they're really active days. And on our French retreats, which aren't just surf ones we get, we actually get, um, we do a gastronome week. We do a reboot week where we get a French, a French chef to, um, to cook all this amazing French food. And again, we don't do a detox retreat. We just eat lots of good food, drink good wine, and then really active all day. And then we have a gastronome astronom week with um this guy i met called simon brown who was damien hurst the artist chef i worked weirdly i ended up in barcelona 
working for him and I was supposed to be there for health and fitness and they were all just on a massive bender. <laughs> but I got on quite well with the chef <laughs> and he invited him over to France and he goes foraging and cooks these incredible sort of nine course meals and we're doing that um, in this October so that'll be exciting. And is most of it plant-based or do you, are you um, carnivore? No, no, it's a bit of everything actually. He, d- he does cater for um, vegetarian and vegan. He does some amazing vegan food too but it's not specifically and I'm not um, plant-based either but no. trying to eat. Are you? No, no I'm not but I'm, I'm very much on the meat side of things but certainly yeah. my fair share of fruit, veg and have a varied diet. I certainly go into the binges of chocolate and go off the rails every now and again, but yeah, try to get back and put that down to the kids and the stress and the, the sleepless nights, but get back on track. And, and as I say, we're only human. Yeah. I mean, from a health perspective, I think, you know, it's, um, it's like anything, isn't it? You need, you need, you need a good wide contrast of, of good quality. And it's all about the quality, isn't it? Which sometimes you know, I think in places like Portugal and, and France, you get, really good local fresh produce which i think sometimes in this country you feel like that's lacking when you're in this obviously in the supermarkets and things even the fish like we live in devon with the sea is right there but it's not easy to get fresh fish whereas in portugal you go in, or france you go in the supermarket and it's straight off the boat straight into the supermarket whereas here it's all in plastic in tesco's isn't it it's quite frustrating yeah, it certainly is, and the shelves are a bit bare at the moment, and there's no deliveries yeah. coming in, and stocks are low. So, you know, here, here's hoping things uh, we see recovery and we see jobs getting filled because yeah, that fresh food is becoming a bit scarce, which is a bit of a worry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're lucky; we've got a few local farmers. We always get the vegetables and things off around here, and we just um, so it's all we're quite lucky in that respect. But yeah, it's it's. Um, there's, there is a marked difference, I think, in just local fresh produce because most of the most of the um, stuff in like, the supermarkets here are just that things shouldn't last that long, should they? And they're not they're not made <laughs> they're mass produced and they're, it's not. And I think sometimes that's why you see a lot of old people in Portugal walking around in Nazaré and they just eat simply, eat healthy, less chemicals. And they're active, you know. Yeah. It's good. They've got that balance. Blakey, it's been brilliant. It's been a great just 45 minutes catching up with you. Tune the fat. It's uh it's an interesting life you guys lead down in Devon. And it's something Abby and I and the kids, we, we definitely plan on getting down there for the surf yeah. fitness. Yeah, you should come down for everything that you guys do. We love watching it. Um, and even your Nazare trip, all that sort of stuff, excursions is certainly on our to-do list in the future. So thank you for connecting. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Not at all. It's been, it's been great and um, I'm definitely going to keep in touch. So thanks very much. Cool. Thank you. Nice to meet you.